Welcome to the Queer Spirit Podcast. I'm your host, Nick Venagoni. Here we have conversations with artists, healers, and activists who enliven the LGBTQ communities and who empower our queer spirits to flourish. My guest today is Langston Khan. Langston is a New York City-based shamanic practitioner specializing in emotional clearing and radical transformation. He stands firmly at the crossroads, his practice informed by the Western modality of inner relationship focusing, initiations into traditions of the African diaspora, the contemporary shamanic tradition of the last mask center, and the guidance of his helping spirits and ancestors weaving it all together. He joyfully endeavors to bring spirituality out of the dark and dusty recesses of esotericism and into our daily existence where it can aid us in the realigning with ecstatic energy of our soul's purpose and allow us to become the people who can create the change we wish to see in the world. We discuss his journey to becoming a shamanic practitioner and the way he works with emotional clearing. We also talk about spiritual adulthood, cultivating healthy boundaries, and working with the ancestors. Find out more about Langston and his offerings at occupy-your-heart.com. Hi, Langston. Welcome to the show. Hi, Nick. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah. So you do a variety of different kinds of healing and counseling work with people. And I thought we could start out by having you share with us the story of how you first came to doing this healing work. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, whenever I start to tell this story now, I just want to start like at the beginning at birth. But to summarize, I think really the first spark of wanting to do this work was just being a kid who was very empathetic and really felt it was important to care for those who others weren't caring for. Like I would always be the kid who was noticing like, oh, no one's friends with that kid. So I feel now I have to be friends with them and help them. And there's some beautiful things about that and some, you know, patterns I had to change with that later on. But I, I always just, ever since I was little, I just had that sense in me that that was important. I think partly because of my mom reading me a lot of fairy tales. And there's that real ethos in fairy tales that, you know, you have to, you never know who's a fairy in disguise. You have to care for everyone. <laughs> and the people you take care of often will be the people that can help you later on and all that kind of ethic. And so I really took that to heart for whatever reason. and. As I was growing up and getting older, especially in my teenage years, I started realizing the people I was most drawn to, not because of just wanting to help them, but because they were the creative people and sensitive people and open people and weird people were often also the people that were in a lot of pain that were maybe self-harming or medicating or self-medicating or being diagnosed with various types of mental challenges. And... I wanted to understand why it seemed like the people that were most sensitive and open to what I perceived as actual, the possibilities of reality were the people that were in the most pain also so often. And I think what another little event that allowed me to start taking that wondering and that questioning outside of just my circle of friends and start thinking about the world was I had this incredible middle school teacher, Mr. Cohen, who would wake up at like 5.30 in the morning so he could get to school at six and meet with these uh, like three middle schoolers, like seventh graders, and read countercultural 60s literature with them. So we read like One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. And in that book, they talk a lot about the combine, this like sort of force of the embodiment of all the structures of oppression that work to sort of grind us down and help us to conform. And that really opened my eyes to stop just looking at sort of personality conflicts and start looking at the larger societal structures that were part of the root of the pain I was seeing my friends in. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I could have articulated it that well at that time, but Mm -hmm. those gears were starting to turn in my head. And I was so, I started to ask bigger questions about, so why culturally do we have rising rates of mental illness every year? As I was reading about the history of the mental health system and, you know, all of these different dysfunctions culturally I wanted to find answers for. And the first place, so so I just started seeking in a lot of different traditions. And the first place I found was witchcraft and Wicca. You know, it was like the height of that sort of unholy alliance between, you know, 
new age, neo Wicca and capitalism where everyone listening to Enya on their CD players. Uh-huh. <laughs> We're watching the craft. And so me and my friends in middle school and someone in high school started a coven together and just started doing spells and rituals. And that was really beautiful for a time. But eventually my friends kind of grew out of it. And meanwhile, I was in college, even at the end of college, still identifying as a witch, but noticing that it had become for me more of an identity rather than a real grounded praxis. And so I started seeking a teacher that could help me to really ground that practice in my life and take it seriously. And I found this incredible priestess who created this really rigorous structure of training in a very, she was a Gardnerian witch. And she was very much like what you might call a hard guard, like someone, so as some people don't know, Gardnerian Wicca was the origin of a lot of what you see in Neo-Wicca today. And it was a very initiatory, secretive tradition that was very structured and formalized. So for me as a, you know, super watery person, double Pisces, that structure was so helpful for me. And I think as we started, you know, working to train, to open our psychic senses, to like meet every full moon, to do magic, to be honoring the seasonal rites, I just started to have these intense initiatory experiences and dreams of people on the street suddenly looking at me in a strange way and then giving me some precious object they felt I needed to have. All these strange synchronicities and occurrences happening in my life. And my teacher was guiding me through them, but after a while, it started to feel like my spirituality was happening in one place and witchcraft had become my religion or Wicca had become my religion. And I didn't come to Wicca for a religion. So eventually I realized that it was time to leave that tradition. And I, so I was after about, you know, three or four years, this is very compressed telling of this. And at the time I was dealing with a lot of emotional problems, a lot of chronic illness issues and a lot of family stuff and trauma that was coming up and wanting to be addressed. And so I went to a shamanic healer for the first time because I had this dream in which one of my helping spirits was coming to me. And my Wiccan teacher was on a bed in a forest next to me in that dream. And my helping spirit kept landing on my chest. But as it landed on my chest, there were all of these sort of parasites and icky biting insects falling off of it onto me. And so I turned to my teacher and asked, can I tell it to leave? And she was like, well, ask for its name first. And so I asked for its name and it told me its name and then it flew away. And so I took that dream to my teacher and we journeyed on it together. And we all got these various answers of like, you idiot, like this is not about a problem that you have to fix for me. Because I was like, oh no, is my helping spirit sick? And he's like, no, this is a problem in you that I'm reflecting back to you. Which I later found out was a very traditional sort of way animal helping spirits communicate through symbolic language and in many indigenous traditions around the world, this reflecting disease through showing up as diseased. And so that's what led me to go to my first shamanic healer to see like, how do I address this? I don't know what this is in me that this is trying to reflect. And the first shaman I went to saw this energy in me that they just sort of yanked out and said, this is just your stuff. It's not like an intrusive spirit. It's just, just your stuff. And so it, my symptoms of the illness I was experiencing went away for two weeks, pretty drastically. And then it came back way worse. And so I was like, there's something that's not being addressed here by just the yanking out of it. And eventually I found my way to another shamanic practitioner and that was Christina Pratt. And she was able to tell me to, to see the same structure that the other shaman saw without me saying anything about it, but then tell me what each layer of it was and why it was there, what age it had formed, what emotional components it had in my life. And then tell me ultimately, I'm going to take this off of you, but I'm going to give it back to you because you have to transform it with this specific protocol. And so that was like my... Well, one of the protocols was that I had to journey to the sun 19 times and move through the sun. And it was this very complicated thing where it had to be no more than, you know, once every three days, but no less than once a week. And so it took me like a whole year to actually do that 19 times in a row without missing one. But that was like my journey boot camp. And it just sort of started to open me up to the world of shamanism and allowing me to engage with the helping spirits that have been trying to get my intention in a way that was 
actually conscious instead of just like, oh, I happened to dream tonight about this helping spirit or this random person on the street happened to come up to me. And that was a big shift for me. But as I was working on healing these deep rooted family of origin patterns and these energetic structures, what happened was I got to a place where I was like, okay, I fully healed this. I did a big ritual at a river. I'm ready to let go of this. And then I pulled a tarot card to see what the state of my health was now. And I got the seven of pentacles. And that's the car with a man standing, staring at the vines, looking hopeless. And so I was like, oh, this is horrible. I'm still stuck in this mess. And, but then I ended up signing up for the cycle teachings, this four-year training program in becoming a spiritual adult and not becoming a shaman, but just using shamanic tools and becoming a person who can sort of engage these indigenous spiritual technologies in a way that is it of integrity, not just trying to shoehorn them into our contemporary Western understanding, but actually stretching your own capacity of your heart to engage these tools as a spiritual adult. And within the first retreat, we had this fire ritual where we were able to discard anything that was in the way of our authenticity and our relationship with our authentic self so we could sort of restart that relationship. And I gave up the energy that I'd been working with, which was these sort of black vines that I was using instead of having healthy boundaries. And in that moment, I felt them just leave. I didn't need to draw a tarot card. I just knew they were gone. And that was a huge moment for my path and why I do the work I do now, because it showed me that it's not enough to just be following our own individual path of healing, but so often to heal wounds that were created in community, we need the structure of community ritual to hold that transformation. And so that led me on this path of this intensive training and then afterwards, continuing to realize the more I took away the stuff that was in, a way, in the way of me experiencing my own divinity and my own the energy of my purpose that I'm here to live, the more I started to realize that shamanic healing work actually is a really excellent vehicle for my gifts in the world and to, for me to start addressing some of those root problems that I was seeing culturally, like birth not being tended initiation into adulthood not being tended, death not being tended well, people being helped to move on, people not being made into true elders that are honored and respected and can share their medicine they've learned over their lives. And so for me, this way of working with shamanic healing and emotional clearing is a way of beginning to help people move into that experience for themselves of opening their heart to those energies and those truths and their own unique genius that they're here to live. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's quite a journey. Thank you for sharing all of that. Yeah. Going back to one of the things you had mentioned a moment ago, which we had talked about a little bit before the recording, which was the importance of spiritual adulthood and the importance of that. I wonder if you can say more about your experience of that. Yeah, and that's a funny term. I think a lot of people have a lot of assumptions about what that means when they first hear because we all have different ideas of what it means to be an adult. And one of the things I see right now in the popular discourse a lot of the time is like, you know, we're all posting on Facebook, like, uh, adulting today is really hard, you know, and like, and is any, and the, I see this theme repeated again and again of like, is anyone really adult? Doesn't everyone just feel like a big kid trapped inside of an adult body? And I would say no, actually. And I don't mean that in a judgmental or critical way, but I think that to assume that everyone has this experience of feeling like a child in an adult's body is to normalize a pathology. And again, I don't I mean pathology in a critical way. I mean pathology as something our soul is trying to communicate to us that is wrong, that is off to that soul, that it's wanting to shift and change. And I think that fear and that anxiety of feeling like a kid in an adult's body is not how human beings have always felt. I think it's actually a fairly recent thing. Not recent in terms of like the last decade, but recent in the last like, you know, maybe 100 years. And I guess, you know, we hear these terms like initiation into adulthood. And we think it's some like intense rite where someone has to undergo a fierce challenge and then they honor their, their new sexual prowess or something or their ability to get bare children and then they come back into their community. And that's maybe true to some extent. But from talking to people who have actually experienced that kind of journey in an indigenous context, it's a lot more about fully opening up 
to a new relationship with the numinous, with the sky, with the earth, with the sacred elements that it's really hard to have if you haven't been supported in dropping your family of origin patterns and the baggage from your childhood and your parents and the ways you resent your community perhaps. And then once you've dropped that and once you've stepped into that relationship with no longer depending on your parents to be your parents, but just as fellow adults, and then you're able in a sense to also realign with that energy that you came here to embody, that unique thing that you came here to do. Not as a, not like to be a teacher, but this energetic experience of something that you're constantly realigning and reorienting yourself to and trying to find more precise, more sustainable, more powerful vehicles for the expression of that are also nourishing to you and meet the needs of the world. And so it's really hard to do that and to move that process when you don't have actual elders who have done that supporting you in that process. Yeah. I have a couple ideas about that too. Part of it is, you know, you mentioned indigenous culture where a lot of that is still really held. And I think that the modern world doesn't really hold the idea of family as community as an important aspect. And so I think that there are people, you know, like single parents or people who just have didn't have the proper parenting themselves in order to be able to provide parenting to their children or support to their children in the way that they can because of their challenges or not having family or community around. And then I also think that, you know, coming of age processes like they do in indigenous cultures, which are still sort of held in some cultures like quinceanera and other things that happen more culturally, but not are part of particularly mainstream Western culture about coming of age, you know, moving into puberty or moving into adulthood, you know, vaguely maybe graduating from high school or graduating from college for some people who have the privilege of that. But there isn't really the process or the experience of saying, okay, now I'm going from this to this and it's time to grow up, it's time to be responsible, it's time to, you know, take this next step. And I also think that a process that happens for queer people in particular, which is similar to this, is the process of coming out, you know, depending on where they are in their life and who is there to support them or not support them can really affect them in that way. Absolutely. So yeah. I know that you had said that this, you thought, you also believe this was especially important for queer children or queer people. Mm, I wonder yeah. what else you want to say about that. Yeah, I think that's a really good question. And so I think what I mean when I say that this is especially important for queer children is that we see, you know, we blame like bullying or something, for example, or a lack of cultural acceptance on a lot of the epidemic of suicide among queer youth that we see in our culture. And I think that can certainly be a component, but I wonder if even more so part of the issue is the lack of queer elders that those children can be exposed to and see and actually feel held and welcomed by. I had a very moving experience recently for, well, I was at Short Mountain Sanctuary, the Radical Ferry, sanctuary. And just to give like a, I'm sure you know about this, but just to give a brief history, you know, the radical fairies were founded by Harry Hay and others as this way that the queer people could have a sanctuary space where they could truly be in all of their multifaceted gender expressions and be in relationship with nature in places that maybe felt scary for queer people to go. And, and also the queer people that were like gathered in the cities could have a place to go where they could be in relationship with nature again. And I mean, that's a gross oversimplification of the radical fairies, but I went for the first time to one of the sanctuaries, there's a few different sanctuaries around the country, and it was a really heart opening experience for me to feel this has been given to me by queer elders and ancestors, that I can come here and not have to, you know, like worry about money. Like this place exists for anyone who needs to come there no matter what resources they have 
because queer ancestors were dreaming of queer children that were going to be coming into the world and they wanted to support them. And to me, I realized that was the first time I had ever really had that experience in my life of feeling as a, in my queer identity held in that way. And so I think that's important for anyone to feel that you have elders and adults and ancestors that have been dreaming you into existence, that have been praying for you, that are so excited for your medicine to be here, and they want to support you in any way they can to bring that medicine into the world and share your love with the world, just like they're sharing their love with the world. And, but especially for queer people, we need that kind of container of support because our culture is so abrasive and harmful, you know, yeah, to yeah. queer individuals, especially. Yeah. And because our path isn't going to be like a lot of the people's paths in our life who are in our family of origin. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious if this leads into one of the topics you wanted to share with us, which was how ancestral healing fixed your love life. <laughs> yeah. So ancestral healing is a huge part of my path and sort of a specialization of mine. And so my first experience with my ancestors was actually in my Wiccan tradition. We were doing a ritual for Samhain. And one of the coven members was a pretty gifted medium. And they embodied my grandmother for me. She just spontaneously came down. And I didn't expect her to come. This is who came. And they didn't know anything about her. They didn't know a thing about me or my family or my life. But the first thing they said to me, looked right at me and said, don't believe everything you've heard about me. And at the time, I had mostly only negative stories about my grandmother because my father had a difficult relationship with her. My mother had some encounters with her where she seemed pretty narcissistic. And so that's all I had gotten. And I didn't know her really well in my life. She died before I was old enough to really know her. And so that was a big thing just to feel her presence there and hear her talking directly to me and think, huh, maybe the stories I got from the living aren't the complete picture. And within a week of that ritual, my parents called me up. I hadn't told them anything about doing this. They called me up and said, you know, we just found this letter. We were digging out some boxes. It's from your grandma, Estella. And it says for Langston when he writes his book. And it detailed these generations of ancestors and stories about them that I had had no access to before that moment. And so that was my first experience of feeling when we reach out so often they can reach back even more so if we're willing to step into that vulnerability of asking for help from our ancestors. And so that was my first entryway into this world of ancestral healing. And then eventually in my work in the cycle teachings with the Last Mask Center, there was other ancestral work because I knew I should talk to my ancestors. Like everyone knows, like at least now in like the spiritual world is a big buzzword, like, yeah, we should be connected to our ancestors. But when I tried to show up at my altar, it just felt like an obligation and a burden. I'm like, why am I here? Okay, I'll try my best. I know I'm supposed to reach out to talk to the well ones, not the ghosts. So hello, well ones, where are you? But it just felt like I was talking to them from the bottom of a murky pond. And these people were like trying to shout down to me from above that were like bright and luminous, but I couldn't really see them. <laughs> and so it wasn't any fun. I would like skip my practice a lot. I would forget about it. There was so much resistance. And it wasn't until I started doing deep ancestral healing work in my shamanic practice of going to the roots of the unresolved ancestors that were responsible for problematic patterns I had in my own life, and then fixing those patterns and taking them out of the line after the dead were moved on, that then I was able to start showing up at my ancestral shrine and feeling resourced and supported and loved by these people who only wanted to share their wisdom with me so that I could live the most joyful and authentic life possible. I'd never, like, they want, like, somehow I'd never thought about, my ancestors want me to have great sex. They want me to have good food. You know, it's like, not like this, like, worshipful, like, very airy, abstract relationship. It's like, ancestors, the unique thing about them is they know what it is to be a spirit, and they know what it was to be human. Yeah, it's very different than working with gods. Totally. For deity. Yeah, very different than gods and deities. And so then after that experience with the cycle teachings, I started to reach this place in my process where I had dismantled so much, I'd healed so much, but I still felt this place in my heart where I couldn't quite be intimate with. And I was using my skills. I was doing more shadow work, dragging out shadow parts and transforming them. I was, you know, dancing my animal helping spirits. I was doing lots of emotional clearing work, but still I couldn't access this place. And eventually I realized that the reason that, and this is through talking to my ancestors, that the reason 
that I felt this lack of intimacy with myself. And, you know, I realized I'm skipping a little part of this story is that I didn't just get right to like, oh, I'm not intimate with myself. What allowed me to stop ignoring the fact that there was this little niggling sense of lack of intimacy was that I was dating a number of different men. And each time we would reach this place in our relationship where they couldn't engage with a part of themselves that would suddenly come up with some random sentence I said that I had no idea was going to trigger them or connect to that part. And they would just shut down like a wall would come down. And then we could continue engaging afterwards. But I knew in that moment that we wouldn't be able to deepen our relationships. We couldn't go past that wall. And so that happened like three times. And so eventually I have to realize the common denominator here is me. And so I had to turn that question around and ask, who in me is not willing to be intimate with myself? And what I found was that it was that I had done all this work to heal the most problematic ancestors and then start working with them as true ancestors after I healed them. But I hadn't been willing to just wade into the mess of the ancestors whose names I knew. Those many lineages and lines of people, my mother's mother's people, mother's father's line, my, my father's father's line, father's mother's line, and really just systematically work to make sure all of them are well. That felt so overwhelming. So then when I found Daniel Forer's techniques, and I'm a practitioner in his way of working with ancestors as well, in addition, that gave me a framework to really start working at the level of lineage and healing these patterns. And at one point, I started feeling the change in my heart because now, you know, our ancestors are so a part of us. So the part of myself I wasn't willing to be intimate with, with the same part I was leaping over because I thought, oh, well, those ancestors are unresolved, so I can't connect with them, or I don't want to connect with them. I want to do all that effort. But once I started to heal them up and allow them to flow through me, more of me was coming online. And I got this message from my ancestors that this is related to that problem you're seeing in your relationships. And if you would just heal us up, you would have a relationship that didn't have these dysfunctions within less than a year. And I was like, okay, that's nice. Maybe I'm just making that up, wishful thinking. You know, I sort of trust my ancestors, but I don't know. And then I had a divination with this West African diviner of the Dagra people, Maladoma Somme. And the first thing he says without me saying anything was, until you heal your relationship with all of your ancestors, you will continue to see the dysfunction of your relationship with them reflected in your romantic relationships. <laughs> It's that's like fine. Put a You're fine like, point in ah, it. <laughs> come on. Yeah. But it was a great carrot to dive so yeah, yeah. that work. This work that I kind of thought I had already done well enough. Because I was, you know, I was connected to my ancestors. I was doing ancestral healing work for other people. It was very successful. It was going really well. But I think in anyone's deep healing process, eventually you come to a place where you're helping spirits, your guides, or whoever you're engaging with, your intuition is going to tell you, you know, that work you thought you did well enough was well enough for who you were then, but who you are now actually needs a deeper level of work. And so it was true within the same year, finishing healing up those lines, I did find a really fulfilling relationship that no longer had those patterns held within it. And it's been even more than that, it's been beautiful to feel that relationship, that intimate relationship with my family of origin ancestors really supported me. Not the way ancient ones that were responsible for these big problems, but just the ones whose names I knew, like my grandma Stella, like my grandma Lillian Jacks, like these older ancestors who were the first ancestors who emigrated to the U.S. on my father's side, and some of the ancestors who were enslaved on my mother's side. And I've just watched that totally transform my relationship with not just my current partner, but also my ability to enter into deep intimacy in all facets of my life. Mm -hmm. Great. So shifting gears a little bit, I'd like to talk more about your work with other people. And I know that one of the significant things that you do is emotional clearing mm -hmm. with clients. And I wonder if you could tell us what that is and how it works. Absolutely. So I kind of hate the word emotional clearing, actually. I still use it on my website right now, but we sort of shifted to using deep liberation process as another way of talking about it. And the reason I um, dislike that word is I think it makes people think this is all about getting rid of the emotions you don't want. It's, and it's not about that. It's not about entering this like Zen-like fake state when you're always calm and the perfect spiritual master. You know, It's about being able to respond wildly and authentically to life with what the moment is calling from you, 
not getting lost in projections based on your past wounds or trauma that paralyze you or make what is trying to come out of you very twisty, but being able to, to trust your own authentic emotional response again. And so how we do that in these tools of this deep liberation process is first working to just begin to engage our lives as a teacher, learning tools that allow you to notice triggers that are causing you to amp up or shut down in response to them. And then feel into those triggers to find what's most intense that's happening in that moment and track that back to where that dynamic is rooted in your body. Because there's this idea that if something is causing you to amp up or shut down out of proportion to what's actually happening, then there's some way that outer dynamic is mirrored inner dynamic. And so just like I was talking about with the dating, like asking, so who in me is not intimate with myself? It's that same idea. Like I feel like what's most intense, this person is belittling me, asking how am I belittling myself or who in me is belittling myself? And not trying to use your mind, your intellect to figure that out and analyze. And this is related to my childhood because this happened to me but actually dropping into the felt sense in a deep way in your body and allowing the felt sense to respond to you. So that might be like a sudden clenching in your stomach when you ask that, or sudden tears that come to your eyes, an emotional response, or an image of a red wheelbarrow, you're not sure why yet, or a memory that does come up from your childhood, but being willing to move into and trust whatever your body shows you and giving people tools to stay present with what their body is showing them and describe it as best they can and then track it to the root where it first started so they can then clear it there. And when we're willing to go back or when we're able to go back to the first place something started, it often clears every later iteration of that pattern in the person's life. So it's not like you have to like, when you start out in this process, it often feels maybe like picking leaves off trees, this trigger and this trigger and that trigger. And then as you get more skilled in the practice and being guided in it, you can shake the branches and then eventually uproot the whole tree of these patterns. But it's a lot about this idea from a shamanic perspective that our body and our lives are constantly conspiring to get us to look at these stuck places. And so from a shamanic perspective, that's one of the reasons we're constantly encountering these patterns that are like, okay, I date this person, they can't be, I date this person, they can't be, but there's one common factor here and it's me. And just beginning to learn how do we drop into that more intimate, erotic relationship with life that allows us to see how life is responding to us and trying to teach us about ourselves. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious what common complaints you hear from people who are coming to you for this work is. That's interesting. Yeah. Honestly, it's all different types of complaints. Some people are dealing with difficult relationship issues. Some people are dealing with long-term patterns of like eating disorders or anxiety or depression. Some people are, know they need to make a huge transition in their life, like going to law school, but, and they know that's right for them right now, but there's something in them that just totally shuts down whenever they even think about it, and they don't know why. And so they want help being guided into that space to really be with that part of them that's shutting down. And so, yeah, and I think also the biggest thing that I see as a common denominator in almost everyone that comes is difficulty with boundaries. That this is a part of doing this work allows us to redefine how we show up in the world in terms of knowing what we actually need in the moment and being able to give voice to that need in the moment without falling to sort of, you know, wounded child patterns of like the need to keep harmony or the need not to offend or the need to be loved. And so being able to tend and care for those parts of us ourselves, so we're not looking to others to tend and care for them, and then can actually show up and assert our space and really ask for what we need in each moment. And if we're not feeling like we're wanting a certain person or energy in our space, either asking them to leave or change their behavior or leaving ourselves. Mm -hmm. And you offer a free ebook on creating healthy boundaries. I do. Yeah. And I love people reading that and sharing with me their experiences. I get some great stories of people starting to apply some of the methods there in their life and how that changes it. I started offering that even because I was seeing so many clients who really didn't even know what boundaries were. I think, again, it's another buzzword right now that's in sort of like pop psychology, like you need healthy boundaries. But the psychological model of working with boundaries is very much geared towards from the outside in. Like, this is how you should show up if you have healthy boundaries. Or I'm much more interested in what are the reasons 
that we think we need not to have boundaries to survive or that we need to have too rigid boundaries to survive. And how can we work there in that inner space to actually shift our ability to hold really fluid and flexible boundaries that like, you know, for me, I'm a New Yorker, when you're on the subway, you can have them tight to you. And when you're out in nature, they can be open and expansive and they can respond to whatever the needs of your day are. And they can be permeable. So they're drawing in the energy that's serving you like a cell wall and expelling the energy that's not serving you. And they can be intelligent. So they're telling you about the space you're in. Like I think everyone has the experience of walking into a bar and you're not drunk yet. And you just feel that whole mess of like, you know, oozy energy because part of the reason people drink is because it allows them to relax their boundaries a bit. Yeah, and yeah. so starting to learn how do you do that in any space without that extreme space? How do you just start to get a feel for a room just walking into it from what your boundaries are telling you about that space? Yeah, I also think it's important to think about boundaries from the energetic perspective. And as you said, not just monitoring what's coming in, but also monitoring what's going out, right? Because some people are the kinds of people who give too much and then they become drained. Or then there's other people who take too much in and then they become drained, right? And so there's, I think some people are either one way or another is what I've noticed. It's rare to have someone who's both. <laughs> So, and I think that also sort of falls a little bit into the introversion, extroversion thing. That's another podcast. So you have a couple teachings and workshops coming up this year. Can you tell us a little bit about them? Absolutely. So my next class that I'm offering is in the fall, in uh, September, or Energy Body Mastery. And that's a class that where we really work to understand how do we cultivate really strong sense of grounding beyond just like imagine you're a tree you know and how do we cultivate the kind of grounding that can keep us grounded no matter what we're facing throughout our day how do we cultivate those boundaries like i was talking about that can keep us held throughout our day in a flexible fluid way that's not like draining our energy how do we cultivate a clear central channel that connection to our own divinity and divine energy without all the stories about like what god might be or might not be and just receiving those energies of blessing and protection in our life and then how do we, once we've really created that energy body, how do we move into that inner landscape and begin to do that work I was talking about of self-inquiry, of engaging with the parts of ourself that made certain choices so that we could survive at certain times in their life, but they're stuck in those survival patterns. How do we begin to understand the choices they made and help them feel supported in making new choices so we no longer feel dragged into these old patterns from childhood? And that whole work is really offered under the auspices of wanting to help people become the people who can actually create change in the world in the oppressive structures that many of us live in. That Because where that work starts, to me, is in looking where we carry those oppressive stories within ourselves. And so this lays the foundation to really begin rooting out those cultural troubles and how we've internalized them in ourselves, or queer people especially, like, Things like internalized homophobia or internalized ideas of what, how a man is allowed to use their power, how a woman is allowed to use their power, how a non-binary person is allowed or not allowed to use their power. And beginning to really understand the ways we've taken on the oppression we've experienced and begin to continue to enact it in ourselves and begin to make a change there to mm -hmm. show up for ourselves with more compassion. Yeah. And did you want to mention the other class? or? Yeah carried away there with energy body mastery. So the other class I'll be offering, I'm going to be assistant teaching this class this year and I'll be offering it next year. It's masks of illusion and the authentic self. And this is the retreat I was talking about that totally changed my life and my process that I did about eight years ago for the first time. And so I'm going to be offering that and it's in Arizona and it's just a whole retreat designed to use indigenous spiritual technologies, and, but in a contemporary way. And maybe that's sort of backwards. It's like we're stepping into the mindset of a very ancient animistic way of working with ourselves and with the world, but learning the tools that allow contemporary Western people to get there without getting all stuck in their own sense of the ways you've sort of internalized being told that animism isn't real or that we can't you know, engage with fire as a living being to create transformation in our lives. And the whole theme of the retreat is helping you to 
repair your relationship with your own authenticity, to lay a foundation for you to begin to understand what the energy of your purpose feels like and bring it more fully into the world. And along, and so this year is the first year actions are prerequisite for those retreats, which is knowing how to do shamanic journeying and also taking energy body mastery, that class I was talking about. So if you feel like you can't wait for the fall and you really want to take that class now, people who sign up for the masks retreat in June get a self-paced version of that course they can take with support. Got it. And the class in the fall, the energy body mastery is also going to be online as well, correct? Correct. Yeah. So the class in the fall is an online course and this class, the, the mass retreat is in person. Okay, great. And we'll have links to that on the show notes so people can find it there too. So Langston, can you share with us a person, practice, or experience that has supported your queer spirit to flourish? Yeah, well, absolutely. The cycle teachings did because they just really allowed me to engage with the constructs of masculinity and femininity and how I held them in myself and how those see how false those were ultimately that there were these cultural constructs that ultimately only serve to limit our power and and limit the flow from the above to the below from yin and yang these expressive energies that are meant to be in complementary dualist relationship with each other to instead put them in opposition to each other men are good women are bad or you know men can do this women can do this and so for me it was the cycle things that really allowed me to drop into a space where I can engage those two parts of me and fully dismantle them and then allow this new energy to come out of me that I had never seen before, that felt unpredictable, that felt terrifying, but felt delicious to embody this sense of my own beauty that I wasn't looking to the world to reflect, that I could just find on my own and bring into expression. And I think as a queer person, that was just vital for me to be able to shed the ways I internalize those oppressive structures around gender and still identify as a man, but to say this is what a free black man looks like, someone who can, you know, when I want to wear my hair long, wear makeup or wear clothing that might be called more feminine, wear something entirely different another day and just be completely fluid and expressive and open to how my own beauty is wanting to be expressed in the world in any moment. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Thank you. So where can people find you and learn more about your work and your events? My website is occupy-your-heart.com. And yeah, I try to update that fairly regularly. I'm also very active on uh, Facebook and on Instagram as well. Okay. Well, thank you for being here today and sharing about your work. Yeah, thank you so much, Nick. Do you feel lost or stuck? Or are you alone on your healing journey? If you're seeking guidance or support, I'm here to help. I offer online coaching and counseling for queer spiritual folks from all over. Schedule your free consultation with me now by going to queerhealingjourneys.com. I look forward to supporting you on your path. To find the resources we discussed today, find the show notes at thequeerspirit.com. And if you enjoyed the show, remember to subscribe, rate, and review on iTunes. This will help us reach and support more queer people all over. Thanks for listening and see you next time.